Good evening and welcome to our school's annual Martin Luther King event. This year it's part of our Civic Discourse Project and it's the fifth event on our theme this academic year on renewing America's civic compact. I'm Paul Carice. I'm the director of the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership here at Arizona State University. Our larger series, the Civic Discourse Project, is now in its fifth year and we have been delighted this year to return to in-person events. And we're particularly grateful to those who have joined us here in person to help us rebuild civic discourse in Arizona and beyond. We are also happy to be collaborating again with Arizona PBS on recording all the events in the series. And we are live streaming tonight's event. Edited episodes will appear uh, posted on the Arizona PBS website. Also on our own schools uh, website. We encourage you to look at our video archive there. We have a YouTube page. Um, all of our speaker events, uh, including the webinars during the severe COVID period, are archived there for the past five years. Um, everything in the Civic Discourse Project, individual lecture events, these dialogue events, as we're doing tonight. And our website is at scetl at asu.edu. On the theme of civic discourse, we're happy to have uh, with us tonight several civic leaders from the Arizona community, also ASU faculty and staff from other units. I'm not sure if everybody's actually showed up in, in the room or just registered online, but a member of the state uh, legislature, uh, Senator Martin Cazada was gonna be with us, um, Mike Langley of the Racial Equity Advancement Project, Avery Zola of the Arizona Clean Elections Commission, and several leaders from the Great Hearts Academy. We're also happy to have Adam Chuttero, the Interim Dean of ASU's uh, O'Connor College of Law with us, and GLA Harris, a Dean from the Thunderbird School of Management at ASU. The school has worked hard now for five years to convene a high-level conversation in the Civic Discourse Project, single speaker events, dialogue events like tonight, and an annual conference each February. Altogether, we try to encompass a wide range of views and reasonable disagreements. This practice of intellectual diversity and civil disagreement is a public extension of our academic program, our courses, our degrees, our student experiences, all together trying to reconnect liberal arts education with civic education in a major public university. So for all the students out there or people who care about students, uh, that might be some of you, um, we hope you will pick up some information at our table uh, outside our academic programs, our experiential learning, uh, and other programs. Also take a look at our uh, website. I think we have a new flyer out there about our philosophy, politics, economics, PPE, undergraduate certificate we're just launching this year. Tonight's dialogue event is the second of a third of a three-part series this year entitled, Can We Talk Honestly About Race? Skettle's friend and partner from ASU's uh, O'Connor College of Law, Professor Jim Weinstein, approached us with this idea. We're grateful for support from the former dean of the law school, Doug Sylvester, and the current interim deans uh, for making the series a reality. Just one COVID note before uh, I briefly introduce our two guests uh, for this dialogue on the meaning and definition of systemic racism. ASU is asking everyone in the room to wear masks unless you're drinking and because of the COVID concerns, we have only uh, drink tonight and not uh, uh, beverages and, and not any food with a reception. So to our two guests, uh, I'll introduce both of them and then I'll ask you to, to uh, join me in welcoming them, welcoming them to Arizona and to ASU. Jason Riley will speak first. He's a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a columnist for the Wall Street Journal where he has written about politics, economics, education, immigration, and social inequality for more than 25 years. He's also a frequent public speaker, and he provides commentary for television and radio news outlets. After joining the journal in 1994, Mr. Riley was named a senior editorial page writer in 2000, then a member of the editorial board in 2005. He then joined the Manhattan Institute, a public policy think tank focused on urban affairs in 2015. Riley is the author of four books, Let Them In, The Case for Open Borders, that's 2008, Please Stop Helping Us, How Liberals Make It Harder for Blacks to Succeed, 2014, False Black Power, question mark, 
2017, and most recently, Maverick, a biography of Thomas Sowell. That's from 2021. Mr. Riley earned his bachelor's degree in English from the State University of New York at Buffalo. Here is for upstate New York. And he has also worked for USA Today and the Buffalo News. Speaking in response tonight is Professor Lara Bazelon of the University of San Francisco School of Law, where she holds the Barnett Chair in Trial Advocacy. She also directs two legal clinics at the law school on criminal and juvenile justice and on racial justice. Before that, Laura worked for seven years as a trial attorney in the office of the, public, the federal public defender and for three years as the director of the Loyola, Loyola Law School Project uh, for the Innocent. A graduate of Columbia University and NYU School of Law, Laura clerked for the Honorable Harry Pregerson on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. She's also a contributing writer for Slate and Politico magazine, including a long-running run, series in Slate on wrongful convictions. Her essays and op-eds have been published in other venues ranging from the New York Times and the Washington Post to the LA Times. And her book, Rectify, The Power of Restorative Justice After Wrongful Conviction, was published in 2018. So our format tonight, Jason will speak for about 20 minutes, and then Laura will respond for about 20 minutes. In part two of the program, I'll join them up here uh, on stage to pose some follow-up questions in an interview. And then part three is for those of you in the room in the audience. Uh, so think of brief questions you might like to pose to our two guests. With that, for this dialogue on systemic racism, defining terms and evaluating evidence, please join me in welcoming Jason Riley and Laura Bazelon. Thank you for that, uh, that kind introduction, and I want to thank all of you for giving me an excuse to get out of snowy uh, New York City uh, for a few hours anyways. Um, and I, I also want to thank the uh, ASU for putting on uh, these events and, and inviting me to participate. I, I think it's extremely important, uh, particularly for uh, students out there to hear different points of view on the issues of the day, and I think that's become a real problem um, on our college campuses lately, where students should be learning about different ways to look at public policy, sharpen their critical thinking skills, figure out where different people are coming from. Unfortunately, on a lot of campuses, that's not happening, or at least it's not happening to the extent that it should be. I think increasingly, students are being taught what to think instead of how to think. Uh, they're being taught that it's okay to silence people you disagree with, disinvite them as speakers, cancel them, instead of grappling with their arguments. So I'm glad that ASU is pushing back at this trend, and I'm glad all of you decided to, uh, to join us this evening. I was asked to say a few words about uh, systemic racism. Um, but to be honest, it's a term that I generally avoid in my own journalism. Uh, precisely because it means different things to different people. Uh, when I do use it, I usually qualify it or put it in quotation marks. Uh, but if I had to take a stab at what people who do use it are getting at, I would say that they're getting at uh, racially disparate outcomes in society. Systemic racism is used as a sort of all-purpose explanation for why there are black-white gaps and educational achievement, or criminal behavior, or income, or employment, and so forth. Now, I don't think it's useful to get into a semantic debate, so let me stipulate that racism exists. Uh, there may be less of it today than there used to be, but it hasn't gone away entirely. And I don't think it ever will, any more than sexism or anti-Semitism or homophobia will be going away anytime soon. I guess I have uh, more or less a tragic view of human nature, unfortunately. Moreover, I will stipulate that racism, uh, whether you want to call it systemic or unconscious or structural or hidden or whatever, can contribute to disparities. For me, the issue is not whether racism exists. It's always existed. 
The more relevant issue is to what extent can black-white disparities in the third decade of the 21st century be attributed to racism? And to what extent can they be attributed to other factors? And my problem with the focus, the laser focus on systemic racism is that it crowds out meaningful discussions of other factors, which I would argue are playing a far larger role in racism and the disparities that we have today. Talking constantly about systemic racism is a rather intellectually lazy and unsophisticated way of explaining these group differences. It's used to shut down a deeper discussion. People cling to racism as an all-purpose explanation, almost like a child clings to a security blanket. There are many reasons for this, and I hope we get to a chance to discuss some of them. But it's most important, it's also important to note that this is a relatively new phenomenon. It's not how civil rights leaders and activists in an earlier era used to approach the discussion of racism. And since we're honoring Martin Luther King this week, I thought I'd say a few words about how his generation approached what's referred to as systemic racism and contrast it with the approach taken by a lot of activists today. And I want to use a personal anecdote to illustrate the comparison. A few years ago, I wrote a column in the Wall Street Journal about the prevalence of violent crime in poor black neighborhoods. And in the column, I used a quote from Dr. King, who once told a black co congregation, do you know that Negroes are 10% of the population in St. Louis and responsible for 58% of the crimes? He said, we've got to face that. We've got to do something about our moral standards. King said, we know that there are many things wrong in the white world, but there are many things wrong in the black world too. We can't keep on blaming the white man. There are things we must do for ourselves. Now after the column ran, a number of readers contacted the paper and accused me of making up the quote, which comes from a 1961 profile of King written by the famous black author James Baldwin for Harper's Magazine. Now I was a little surprised by this reaction because these days all you have to do is Google a quote to find the source. But what really struck me about the accusation is that the people making it apparently just couldn't believe that the nation's most prominent civil rights leaders used to speak this way about problems in the black community and the role of personal responsibility. Now King was obviously a uniquely gifted and capable leader, and I'm not suggesting that black people today need another King, they don't. What I'm suggesting is that King represented a type of leadership, a type of thinking, a good faith approach to closing racial divisions that politicians and social activists today barely even give lip service to. King and his generation of leaders, people like Thurgood Marshall and Roy Wilkins, who was the head of the NAACP during those crucial years in the 1950s and 60s, they believed that whites obviously had a role to play in changing a fundamentally racist system. But they also understood that blacks had a role to play and they were willing to hold blacks accountable despite the white racism, the legal and rampant white racism that existed at the time. They operated under the belief and tried to instill in young people the belief that blacks must succeed notwithstanding these racial barriers, that blacks can't sit around waiting for whites to get their act together first that there's no time for that. Now contrast that with the activists and politicians today who spend much more time making excuses for the kind of antisocial behavior that prominent black leaders of the King era would regularly condemn. This contemporary leadership doesn't really want to discuss black behavior. They want to discuss white behavior and of course systemic racism. The assumption is that black behavior is almost irrelevant because after all, racism still exists. 
So they send young black kids out into the world with a chip on their shoulder. They tell them the cops are gunning for them. The teachers are racist, the tests are racist, the employers are racist, the judges and prosecutors and the entire judicial system is stacked against them. And they tell them that the world owes them. And if they don't make it, if they don't succeed, it's really not their fault. So at a time when young blacks today are much more likely to experience racial preferences than racial slights, at a time when you have a generation of blacks who came of age with a twice elected black president, black attorneys general, blacks running the nation's largest cities and police forces and school systems. We have people in institutions and in, 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 in positions of influence and authority insisting that blacks can't be held in any way responsible for these persistent racial gaps until white racism has been essentially vanquished from America. In many cases today, you're dealing with black leaders and activists who consider any focus on black responsibility or accountability to be itself a form of racism. And you're dealing with an academic and political and media establishment that for the most part takes the same view. I would also caution against assuming that the activists, the academics, and the media elites sounding off on cable news and speaking for blacks as a whole uh, actually represent most black people in this country. Since the King era, there's been a growing disconnect between the priorities of these elites and the wants and the needs of everyday blacks. To cite just one example, Groups like Black Lives Matter are focused on what they consider systemic racism in policing and the criminal justice system. That is a debate that, of course, reached a fever pitch with the George Floyd protests. The entire nation, or so it seemed, came to agree that policing was a major problem in our inner cities and that it was exacerbating racial inequality. But as I watched this play out, the narrative didn't seem right to me. I've lived in low-income black neighborhoods, gone to school in these neighborhoods, worked in these communities, and I can't recall the police ever being perceived as a bigger problem than the criminals, which made me skeptical. Were the people sounding off on television and Twitter really representative of the people who live in these communities? Let me offer you some data. In a Gallup poll released in 2020, 81% of black Americans said they wanted the police presence in their neighborhood to remain the same or to increase, 81%. Just 19% said they wanted it to decrease. Another Gallup poll released a year earlier asked black and Hispanic residents of poor income neighborhoods specifically, of low income neighborhoods specifically, about policing. 59% of both black and Hispanic respondents said, quote, they would like the police to spend more time in their area than they currently do, unquote. In 2015, which is after Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, Missouri, a poll found that a majority of black respondents said police treat them fairly, and far more blacks than whites, by a two to one margin in fact, said that they, quote, want a greater police presence in their local communities. Nor is this a recent phenomenon. Crime control has been a priority of blacks for a long time. In 1993, a Gallup poll found that 82% of black respondents said that the criminal justice system doesn't treat criminals harshly enough. 75% of blacks wanted more cops on the street to combat crime, and 68% said we ought to build more prisons so that longer sentences can be given. So just to be clear, it's fine to advocate for fewer police, or for spending less money on policing and so forth, but let's not pretend that this is anything close to the view of most black people, and especially most black people who live in high crime areas. This is the view of black elites in the media, in politics, in academia, and among activists. And they are, for the most part, speaking for themselves. This is not to say that blacks are indifferent 
to racist cops or police brutality, both of which exist. They're not. But they also understand that the bigger problem in violent communities is criminality, not policing. However imperfect law enforcement is, given a choice, the law-abiding blacks in these communities, who of course are the overwhelming majority of blacks in these communities, have consistently chosen more policing over less policing. You'd never know that listening to most media commentators, present company excluded, of course. And I just mentioned that as a cautionary tale of how we should be careful about conflating the views of what we hear in the media on behalf of people in these communities with the actual views of people in these communities. I'll stop there, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lara Bazelon. Thank you so much, Dr. Carice, for the introduction. I am so happy to be here with all of you in person, and I thank you for coming and sitting together in this room and engaging in this conversation. And I have to say it's really nice to be able to talk to students and faculty without wearing masks. Um, and I want to especially thank, in addition to Dr. Kreese, I want to thank Carol McNamara, Marlene Rivas, and of course, Jason Riley, who is a very difficult act to follow, but I'm going to do my best. We are here, as Jason said, to talk about this term, systemic racism. And my feeling is that if you spend any time on Twitter or social media or in the classroom or in journalism or in academia, you are either being told that systemic racism is everywhere and that racism itself is the cause and the reason of everything that ails society, or you're being told that systemic racism is essentially nowhere and that it's being, by some, I think, dismissed as a vestige of the distant past. I want to be clear that it is not my position that systemic racism, which I define, and I think terms are important, and I agree with Jason, this term is so malleable, and I think that's part of what makes it so polarizing, confusing, and dangerous. But from my perspective, the way that I define it is that there are certain racial biases, whether they're explicit or they're implicit, that are baked into American institutions. So that's the way that I define it. And in my opinion, it does exist, and it is prevalent, in institutions, and the one that I'm going to talk about specifically is the one that I feel based on my scholarship and my advocacy and my teaching and my career I can, which is how it plays out or how I have seen it play out in the criminal justice system, which some have taken to calling the criminal legal system because they don't believe that the system as designed actually dispenses justice. So what is the basis for me having this opinion or being up here and talking to you at all? As Dr. Crazy said, I, I started off my career after I clerked as a federal public defender, and so I spent seven years representing people who were charged with very serious felonies up against the, the United States Attorney's Office in federal court. And in that position, I represented hundreds of people. And then after that, I transitioned to academia, but what I do is I train my students how to be lawyers, which means that we have actual clients. So I continue to represent people. And at Loyola in Los Angeles, we ran a very small innocence project and we represented wrongfully convicted people. Since 2017, I've been at the University of San Francisco and my students and I do a variety of things in the clinical setting, including continuing to represent wrongfully convicted people, but also we have this sort of unique partnership with, I should back up and say, we now represent wrongfully convicted people not in the state of California or specifically in the, in the jurisdiction of San Francisco because we have a unique partnership with the San Francisco DA's office where we do two things. We 
have a commission, he has a commission that is designed to investigate claims of wrongful conviction, and then we work with the sentencing unit, and what they're doing is implementing a law in California that allows local district attorneys to recall excessive sentences. In other words, if they believe, quote, in the interest of justice, that the person who is sentenced to a very long time, often life or some equivalent, is sufficiently rehabilitated and no longer dangerous, they can petition the court together with the petitioner's lawyer to have that sentence commuted to time served. In all of these roles over what is now a 20-year period, the vast majority of my clients have been people of color. And there are a number of reasons for that. And I think it's important to be honest about those reasons in the way that Jason talked about, that we are not living in a land of zero accountability and we are not attributing everything to structural racism. And I want to be clear that I am not doing that. I don't think that calculus is racist or admissions tests are racist. And I think when structural racism is used in that kind of elasticized way, or as a catch-all for every single failing, including failings in the criminal justice system, it really is a term that is leached of meaning. But I want to tell you two different stories, if you'll bear with me, that are one born out of a direct piece of advocacy that my students and I did, and one based on a case that I followed very closely, that I think illuminate certain issues that go to my argument that systemic racism in the criminal legal or criminal justice system continues to be prevalent. And I hope that those stories illustrate the problem that I am getting at. So I'm going to begin by saying a couple of data-driven points, although I'm going to keep them short because I'm not an empiricist. But I want to make it clear that I'm not arguing that every single person of color who is accused of a crime is innocent. However, when you look at the National Registry of Exonerations, and this is an organization that has tracked every known exoneration dating back to 1989, and we're now up to almost 3,000, 50% of those exonerated are, are black petitioners, black defendants, people who have been wrongfully convicted. And even when you look at the percentage of the whole prison jail population in this country, the percentage that is African American is roughly 30%. So it's still staggeringly disproportionate. Why is it? that so many more people, statistically speaking, who are black are being wrongfully convicted. Similarly, when we are talking about police violence, is it true that most people who are con ex not convicted, excuse me, when we're talking about most people who are killed at the hands of police or vigilantes, are most of those people black? No, when you look at the numbers, they're not. But statistically speaking, if you are black, you're 2.5 times as likely to die in that violent way. And so it's these statistics too that we need to pay attention to and ask ourselves, why is this? What is going on here that we have this kind of a disparity? From 2019 to 2021, my law students and I represented a young man in Louisiana named Utico Briley Jr. And Utico, at the time that we started representing him, had been convicted. In the recent past, he was convicted in 2013 of an armed robbery. Utico is black, the victim was white, the crime occurred at around two o'clock in the morning on a dark residential street. It took about 90 seconds. The man was held up at gunpoint, $102 was taken. And when he called 911, what he said was, it happened kind of fast and it was pretty dark. And the best that he could do was say that the gunman was someone who was wearing a gray sweatshirt and blue jeans and was dark complected, carrying a pistol. And that was pretty much the description that he was able to give because of the circumstances of what happened and how quickly it happened and the lighting, etc. 18 hours later, Utico was walking down the street in like I think like a couple of blocks away with some friends and the police stopped him. They stopped him because he was black. He was wearing a gray hoodie and he was wearing jeans. They weren't actually blue. They were black. And because they said he was acting suspicious. And they asked him to stop and he ran and they ran after him and they tackled him. And when they tackled him, he had a gun. And I wanna put a pin in that because I think that the gun part is important, but not germane to this specific part of the story. Once they had him, they decided that he matched the description. Even though Utico is light complected, the victim had said that the gunman was 
slim built. Utico is 5'8", and at the time he weighed 185 pounds, and he had a mustache and a beard. So really, he didn't bear a very much resemblance to this person at all, as badly as they'd been described. And what the police did next, at this point it's nighttime, and they call the victim and they tell him that they want him to come down to the station to make an identification, and the victim does not want to go. But they nonetheless pick him up, and when they get him to the station, he won't get out of the car because he's too afraid. And so what they do is they bring Utico out into the parking lot. It's dark, and they shine a spotlight on his face, and he's handcuffed and surrounded by police officers. And the victim, who's literally described as cowering in the seat of the patrol car, is looking out through the windshield at 20 feet at this guy, and he literally has no one else to pick. And he makes an identification. And that was the state's whole case. And what's remarkable about this case is that what I just described to you, a single witness cross-racial show-up identification is the most unreliable, error-prone kind of identification that exists, and yet it's perfectly legal and deployed routinely, mainly against people of color. Where the case gets really interesting is that the prosecution did something else. They listened to Utico's calls from the jail to his lawyer, which is a no-no, but nonetheless, they listened to them, and actually, this proved to be very helpful for us. And on the calls from the beginning, Utico is saying the same thing over and over again, that he's terrified, but also that he was at a hotel eight miles away with a woman, and he gives her first name and her last name, and he says, I'm on the footage. Get the footage. It will clear me. Get the footage, it will clear me. And the prosecutors listened to these calls and they didn't go get the footage. And he said, get my cell phone out of evidence and you will see that it was pinging off these towers eight miles away. And they didn't do that either. And he's talking about this woman that he's with and they don't find her. Okay, well then you would think that maybe his defense lawyers would have done that. They did nothing. They didn't find this woman. They didn't get his, they, they subpoenaed the footage for the wrong time. So then when it came, it was wrong. And then they tried again and been erased. When they got to trial, they stood up and said, we have no obligation to put on a case and we're not putting one on. Which is true, you don't have an obligation, but if your client was eight miles away and can be alibied, then you do have an obligation. You have an obligation to do something and they did nothing. And the trial took about an hour and 45 minutes and then Utico was convicted. And then it came time for the sentencing. So in Louisiana, his mandatory minimum was 10 years, but that wasn't what the prosecution wanted. They wanted to use something called a habitual offender law. Well, what is that, you ask? It's a law that allows the prosecution to quintuple a mandatory minimum sentence if the person has one single prior conviction. You would think that these laws are so-called race neutral, but in fact, in Orleans Parish, New Orleans, where Utico was convicted, the law was used by that local DA, Leon Canazero, who was in office from 2009 to 2020, over 3,000 times, overwhelmingly against black defendants, most of them teenagers. Well, you would say, Utico committed a crime, so he probably did deserve to be habitually offended. This is someone with like a serious violent past. In fact, no, at 17, he had been arrested and had pled guilty to selling a small amount of rock cocaine. So we're not talking about a violent person, and in fact, in most states, something like that would be treated as a juvenile offense. So they employ this law, which the Supreme Court, the sole African-American member of the Louisiana Supreme Court pointed out in a dissent in another case, is straight out of Reconstruction. It's called a pig law, and these laws were designed essentially, as she said in her own words, to re-enslave the African-American population following the end of slavery by ratcheting up penalties for low-level offenses to put people away for as long as possible. And that's exactly what happened. The judge sentenced Utico, who was 19, to 60 years with no possibility of parole. When I would tell people in California this story, their jaws would drop open, that you would give a teenager in a 90-second cross-racial ID robbery essentially a life sentence, that he was gonna come out of there basically in a box. And when you told people in Louisiana, they just shrugged because those sentences were getting handed out like candy. And what I want to leave you with are two things. I mean, first, mercifully, all these years later, we were able to prove to a different judge under a different DA that Utico was eight miles away and that he did not do this. And Utico is out. But I will tell you what his life was like between then 
and 2021, which is the life of most people who are convicted and sent away to these prisons, at least in Louisiana. Many of them are actually converted slave plantations. And what happens to the people who, who are incarcerated there is that they have to go out into the fields every day, who, the people who are able-bodied, and pick crops, including cotton. And you can get written up for not picking cotton fast enough. And the people who oversee them are overwhelmingly white guards on horseback with guns, and they form a line. And if you cross the line, they shoot you. Utico told me, every day that I was out there, I would think about running the gun line before I let these people break me and just get it over with. And I really challenge anybody in this audience, hearing that story and thinking about that tableau, to say that systemic racism is truly a vestige of the past when it comes to our criminal legal system. Because when I look at what happened to you to go, beginning with the stop and ending with that death in prison sentence, I don't see a criminal legal system that was operating very differently in 2013 than it was in 1813. You may think this case is an anomaly. It's actually not. And I could talk to you at length about how what we know about wrongful convictions is actually the tip of the iceberg. And if I had more time, I would tell you the strange way in which Utico's case even came to my attention. But suffice it to say that there are many, many, many people like Utico who are in prison, wrongfully. The second case I want to briefly touch on, and I'm mindful of my time, is a case that you may be familiar with. It's the case of Ahmaud Arbery. And as most folks know, Ahmaud Arbery was shot and killed, this was in 2020, in suburban Georgia when he was out for a jog. He was shot and killed by a man named Travis McMichael, who with his father, Gregory McMichael, and another man, Mr. Bryan, chased him down as he was running down the street in broad daylight, unarmed. And as the video surveillance that we're probably all familiar with shows you, every time Ahmaud Arbery tried to escape from these men, they blocked his path. Uh, when he tried to get around them, the older McMichael told him, stop or I'll blow your fucking head off. He bragged to the police afterwards that he and his son had, quote, trapped him like a rat, and that his son had used a racial slur when he stood over Ahmaud Arbery's dead body. Now, whether you believe the McMichaels and Mr. Bryan were racist or not, Here's the truth. It was undisputed that they felt that they were empowered to act. Why? Because Georgia's citizen's arrest law would protect them. And that law says that you can detain anyone if you have, quote, immediate knowledge that the person committed a crime or reasonable and probable suspicion to believe that that person is a fleeing felon. What is the citizen's arrest law? It is, in fact, a direct descendant of the slave patrols, which existed starting in the 1700s, and they permitted white landowners to hunt down runaway slaves and quash uprisings. And then when the South realized that they were losing the Civil War in 1863 and the whole institution of slavery was imperiled, they codified the slave patrols in the citizen's arrest law. In its original incarnation, black people were not allowed to make citizen's arrests of their own because they were not considered to be, quote, any person. And the person who wrote and codified this law, a man named Thomas R. R. Cobb, was himself a noted white supremacist. And this law, the citizen's arrest law that the McMichaels and Mr. Bryan relied upon, it worked the way that it was designed to work because from 1877 to 1950, nearly 600 black people were lynched in Georgia, often chased down by armed white people who were purporting to make citizen's arrests. And no one prosecuted these cases. And in the same way, in this courtroom in 2021, these three defendants made the same argument, which was that they had a state sanctioned, these are their quotes, duty and responsibility to safeguard our communities. It didn't work, but it very well could have. Why do I say that? Well, first of all, the outcome of the, this trial was in doubt, and I, I believe that the jury reached the right outcome. But what's really interesting is the case almost never made it into the inside of a courtroom in the first place. So for weeks, the Arbery's and their advocates advocated for the prosecution of the McMichaels and the prosecution of Mr. Bryan. In fact, the police who arrived at the scene after Arbery had been hunted down like an animal and left to bleed to death, let the defendants go right there. Again, the citizen's arrest law. It was really only after this video, which Mr. Bryan took himself, went viral, that there was more pressure brought to bear. And even then, 
two different prosecutors in two different counties refused to prosecute this case. One of them wrote, quote, under Georgia law, this is perfectly legal. It wasn't until the state attorney general finally took over that the case was presented to a grand jury, and it was, as we know, ultimately prosecuted. But my point is this. This is a law that existed starting in 1863, and it was designed for a very particular purpose, and it operated in that, ma that manner. And it wasn't until 2021 that it was finally repealed. The cases that I've described do not stand for every case that passes through the system. As I said, I'm not up here to tell you that everyone is an innocent victim mowed down by vigilantes or everyone is an innocent person wrongfully convicted of a serious crime and sentenced to die in prison. But what I am saying is that these cases are not actually anomalies. And neither are the legal systems in Georgia or Louisiana or California or Arizona. There are citizens arrest laws everywhere. The laws and practices that I described in Utico's case, these habitual offender laws, they too are everywhere. They exist in nearly every state in the country. They are the cause of many wrongful convictions, excessive sentences, and yes, mass incarceration. I don't believe that these laws would be able to exist and continue to operate in the way that they have if the impact on the white population was anything like the impact on the black population, again, statistically speaking. It's been my experience, and again, my experience, based on 20 years litigating and advocating and writing and researching, that these laws are propped up by practices that are either racist at the root or racist in application or both, and that they turn on a willingness to be indifferent or even have animus toward the value of black lives. Thank you. Thank you both, Jason and Laura, for those uh, presentations. And um, I, I do want to begin by reinforcing, as both of you mentioned, that our gratitude that you accepted our invitation on the premise that you would disagree pretty substantially on, on our topic tonight, um, me the meaning of systemic racism, and does it exist, and, and uh, what to do about it. So, so thank you for that. Uh, I want to begin by asking each of you to talk, having heard each other now, to talk a little bit more about to what extent you disagree on the meaning of uh, systemic racism. Obviously, Laura focused more on the specific part of American life that's the criminal justice. Um, but uh, is, is systemic racism possibly individual prejudice <laughs> repeated on a, on a large um, a scale allowed to operate that way? Does it have to be entrenched in, in law? Um, so what, what, having heard each other, uh, what is this term that we're, we're uh, debating? Well, I think I have kind of two strains of thought about this. I, I think that there are, so the laws that I described, the habitual offender law in Louisiana and the citizen's arrest law in Georgia, those laws are, are, are structurally racist in the sense that when you look and dig down into their roots and their history, they were designed to do a very, very specific thing. They, over time, became race neutral on their face, but in their operation, they still have a very strong disproportionate impact. Ooh, sorry. Sorry. Um, Hopefully, I won't knock anything else over during this. Discussion. Um, so I think that I think that's sort of one kind of law. I think, though, that many laws 
are you know race neutral on their face and then you just have to look and see at how they're applied so just you know there's a lot of ways and tranches of parts of the criminal justice system we can talk about but one is for example that we know that that drug use and drug uh, selling and distribution is pretty even among the black and white populations and yet the arrest and prosecution rates for people of color in that particular um, type of crime is much, much, much higher. So the law is race neutral. You can't sell drugs, no matter what. But then you look at who's getting arrested. You look at who's getting detained. You look at who's getting prosecuted, and you see something that's um, that's disproportionate. But that said, I feel like you can maybe take it too far. I mean, we just had a spirited discussion at at the place that I teach, where you know a position was put forward that. Um, the person advocating for this position said, you know, I don't really believe that, that any laws are race neutral and essentially all laws have to be abolished and we have to start all over again. I, I, I'm not all the way over there. <laughs> um, and, I, and I don't really know how, what, the, what even would take the place of, of the things that, structures and institutions that we have in this country. And so I don't think that that's true. I don't think that we have to sort of assume that every law is, is rooted in racism, but I think we have to look very carefully at the way that the laws are being applied and, and who is being, is being arrested and charged and prosecuted. Um, I, I guess my response is that even if, 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 if Laura got her way and, and uh, everyone who's in prison was wrongly, wrongfully convicted uh, or were, were released if these habitual offender laws went away and the citizens arrest laws went away, um, I don't think you'd make a dent in the problem. Not a dent. Those things do not explain the racial disparities we have in our criminal justice system. It is not full of wrongfully convicted people or people locked up because of uh, uh, habitual offender laws or citizens arrest. That, that, that is, you talked about disparities in wrongful conviction laws. You talked about disparities in police shootings. Unless I missed it, you did not say anything about disparities in crime rates. Who is committing these crimes? And what role does that play in the racial disparities in our criminal justice system. These disparities are huge. You cannot break down, you, you, anyone who wants to break down uh, police shootings by race, but not violent crime rates by race, is not having a serious, honest discussion about the problem. These disparities are huge, and they account for way more than uh, you know, these habitual offender laws for wrongful convictions in our system. Just to give you an example, a typical example, in New York City, blacks are about 25, 26% of the population. New York City is the largest city by far in the United States. Blacks are about 25% of the population. They commit around 75% of shootings in New York City. Whites are about 33, 34%, a little more than a third of the population of New York. They commit about 3% of the shootings in New York. And that disparity is not atypical. That breakdown would apply roughly to Oakland, to Baltimore, to St. Louis, to, to Philadelphia, to Chicago, to Detroit, and on and on and on. If we are going to have an honest conversation about what is driving racial disparities in the criminal justice system, we have to have an honest conversation about who is committing violent crimes in our society and break that down by race as well. So could, go ahead and I'll, I'll try and rephrase it. Sure, our, well I mean I did refer to the fact that a disproportionate percentage of the black population is in prison and jail, and I didn't say that every single person was wrongfully convicted. I think I made a point of not saying that, and I think I did use that statistic, and we do have to grapple with that. And that in itself poses all kinds of subordinate questions, right? Like, how did we get to this point? And I mean, it is absolutely a hard debate and a debate worth having, but I don't think that you can even separate all of that out from 
the root of the problem, or at least going all the way back generations and generations to the fact that, yes, we have a history of horrific racism and depriving people of their rights and their property and their education, and those have long-lasting generational impacts. So I'll just give you an example, and I said I would put a pin in it, so I'll take the pin out. When Utico was arrested, he had a gun, and he had a prior conviction. So why? Why is that? And I don't want to take away his agency. He made his own choices. And you also have to look at the choices that, the limited choices, the very, very limited choices that he had. He was one of 10 children. He was the oldest. Um, he grew up in a house that was basically a drug house. They, they dealt and sold drugs in that house. He was hungry. The lights went out. The kids were often dirty. It was his job to basically go out and make money and feed his siblings. And so he learned to do that by dealing drugs. And that was the way that he made money. He did a lot of other things too. He was in the gifted and talented program. He was a star athlete. He had a ton of friends. He also had cancer and several open heart surgeries. I mean, he had a lot going on. But my point is, when you look at someone like that, and then you look at someone who's just born to a situation where they don't have anything like those challenges, it's much easier for me to understand why he would feel like, okay, this is my option, and now I need a gun to protect myself, and now I'm gonna have this conviction, and it's gonna spiral, and it's gonna spiral, and it's gonna spiral. I don't think it's true that these excessive sentencing laws, in all of their variety and shape and form, are not responsible for a huge part of why we have so many people locked up. They are. We are meeting out sentences that are draconian, that are far beyond what is called for by the harms that people commit. And basically, just don't even consider the fact that, say, we don't maybe need to keep a 65-year-old with a disability incarcerated for the rest of that person's life, or that 90 years plus no parole is an appropriate sentence. I think that we have a big problem in this country it's a problem of violence, and yes, there is much, much more violence within communities of color. It's intra-violence, just like white violence tends to be white on white violence, and it's higher, and we need to think about why. But I think the why part of it also can't be divorced from systemic racism and other problems in our country that go back generations, that don't just disappear because we had the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and Brown versus Board of Education and, and, and. I think that we still have much of our history that we have to grapple with. Well, the, the, the problem is that the violent crime rates we have today do not go back generations and generations and generations. They are unique to modern day America. If you go back to uh, the 1930s and 40s and 50s, you will not find violent crime rates in black communities anywhere near the level they are today. Nowhere near the level they are today. In 1960, black men were murdered at a rate of 45 per 100,000. By 1990, that had climbed to 140 per, per 100,000. A threefold increase. Does anyone believe that there was more racism in 1990 than in 1960? Black communities were much poorer in the 1940s and 50s and much less violent in the 1940s and 50s. To claim that poverty is driving this or that proximity to Jim Crow and slavery, what explains why an earlier generation of blacks, much closer to Jim Crow, living through Jim Crow, much closer to the institution of slavery, had much lower violent crime rates? This is not something that, that you can just chalk up to systemic racism. Uh, society was much, much more racist back then, and violent crime rates in black communities were much, much lower. So could I try and phrase a, dif a disagreement here? Uh, Professor Bazelon thinks that if there are structural um, differences in outcomes in this, we're focusing on criminal justice, um, noticeable patterns of, of difference by race in, in um, prosecutions and convictions and um, 
it's reasonable to look back and keep going back to say there, there must be racism of some form, whether it's cultural, um, in, in implicit, it's in the actual, you know, sort of the fabric of the law. And, and Jason, your view is that it might not always be reasonable to look well, for... I don't know that or, it's a matter of reason or, or not reason. I, I think the laws uh, that Lars described are, are atrocious. And she accurately describes, uh, based on everything I've known and read, uh, their origins correctly, hideous origins. No one is denying that any more than anyone's denying the continued existence of racism in America and racist people like the guys who killed Ahmaud Arbery. The question is to what extent this racism explains the disparities we're talking about and to what extent are you nibbling at the edges? We can talk about police reform, getting rid of racist cops, making it easier to kill, to, uh, to fire bad cops. I'm all for that. Go for it. Do it. I think one of the, the activists are, are, are acting, uh, uh, doing a public service when they go after cops that are getting away with police brutality and the rest. But let me just give you a statistic here. In, in, in 2019 in Chicago, this is a pre-COVID, last pre-COVID year in Chicago, there was something like 492 homicides in the city. You know how many involved police? Three. Three out of 492. You want to go after those three cops? Go, at, go get them. But how much of the problem have you solved? Does Chicago have a policing problem or a crime problem? And, 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 and to, to let cops suck up all the oxygen in this conversation, when they're responsible for three out of 492, uh, what, what are we doing? Okay, you're so nibbling at the edges. Laura, you're. <laughs> well, I don't think that cops have, have sucked up most of this conversation. I don't think we've, we've talked very much about, or I haven't, about policing. It's a national conversation. Oh, sorry. The Floyd protests and all that, and that was all about police policing. So, so a couple of, I, I wanted to just go back for a second. Um, you know, one thing that is very different in this generation and really starting, I think, in the 90s, although my statistics may be a little off, is the unbelievable prevalence of guns in this culture. And we are inundated with them. There are more guns in this society than there are people. And surprise, surprise, now people are armed and they're more violent. It's a lot easier to kill someone when you have access to a firearm, much easier. And so there are many causes for why crime has gone up and crime has gone down. You know, recently there's been all of this agitation about the so-called spike in crime, although it's actually, if you look at the chart, chart, you know, nothing like what we were seeing in the 90s. But even so, what a lot of experts are saying is, yes, well, one, COVID, and two, guns. And that is very different. It is different now to live in this country today where there are more guns than people than it was in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. I think with respect to sort of, you know, can we blame systemic racism for everything, no, we can't. And we need to really think too about like all of the different things that lead up to the statistics that we're seeing today, to the kind of violence. Can we blame everything on guns? No. Can we blame everything on Jim Crow? No. But it's a very complicated, multifaceted problem that isn't reducible to, um, you know, there's a particular culture that's morally reprehensible that's specific to a certain kind of community and we need to sort of focus on that to the exclusion of all of these other causal factors. And so to me, it's an analysis that's quite complicated and I worry that we end up in these echo chambers where it's just has to be one thing or it has to be another thing. And we can just never allow for the fact that the reality is incredibly messy and complicated. All these factors are tangled up with each other. But again, I think this is a misreading of history. In the 1940s and 50s, gun laws, gun restrictions in, these, in this country, loose to non-existent. You, it was much easier to get a gun in 1950. Much easier. There, there were hardly any gun laws in this country. And we had much lower violent crime rates in this country. Even today, uh, gun ownership is much more prevalent in rural areas than it is in urban areas yet urban areas are much more violent. Uh, the gun explanation, I don't think, cuts it. It doesn't hold up to the empirical data. Let, let me ask each of you a sort of uh, devil's advocate question. Um, let me start with, with uh, 
Jason, what, what, what would you think are the causes for the disparity in crimes being committed disproportionately in the, in the African American community? Um, and, and what would you, what are two things that you would recommend uh, uh, to address The racial it? disparities, why are black violent yeah. crime rates so much higher? Yes, proportional to population. Well, I, I would look back at a time when they were much lower than they are today, and in fact, were falling, and, and then look at what was going on among blacks back then, what their situation was in this country. Uh, and again, racism is the constant here. Because the further you go back, the more racism there is. So you should be finding worse outcomes the further you go back. Yet the reverse seems to be happening. So in the 1940s and 50s, you had uh, this migration out of the South, blacks, not just out of the South, it was really a migration from rural areas to urban areas. And you would have expected, uh, as I referenced earlier, uh, black violent crime rates to go up as more blacks went into the cities because cities are more violent than the countryside. But in the 1940s, the black homicide rate fell by something like 18 percentage points. In the 1950s, it fell by another 21 percentage points. So the opposite was happening, all while remaining relatively level among rights. So you had a narrowing of violent crime rates in black America, at least as measured by homicides during this period, when you would have expected to find the, the, the exact opposite of that. So what was going on in black America back then? Well, I think one thing you had going on were civil rights leaders like the ones like Dr. King and the others I quoted earlier, and what their focus was on. Black responsibility, personal behavior. They talked about this. When I quoted King in that church, that was typical. That wasn't some outlier speech that he gave. He and his contemporaries talked like that all the time. Go back and read uh, uh, black newspapers in, in, in cities like Chicago and New York and Washington, D.C., and what they focused on, on, on the black community, behavior, personal behavior. You also had much stronger black families. The black nuclear family was in much better shape. In fact, between 1890 and 1940, black marriage rates in this country were higher than white marriage rates. Every census during that period shows that. So what you've had subsequent to that is a severe breakdown of the black family. As late as the early 1960s, something like two out of three um, black children were being raised in a home with a mother and a father. Today, more than 70% are not. And in some of our urban areas, it's as high as 80, 85%. These kids in Chicago are running around shooting each other because they think that's what a man is supposed to be. That's how you exhibit your manhood. There are no fathers around. Uh, policing, so to speak, these communities as what was happening before. So I think that, that breakdown, um, uh, the, the lack of development of human capital, I would argue, has had a much larger role than racism per se has had in what we see uh, going on in the second R half racism of Racism in cycle. terms of explicit laws and explicit... Explicit laws, racist cops, what have you. Okay. Um, uh, I, I don't see that as... as, as that, that could clearly be contributing to the problem in, ra in ways that Lara, uh, uh, Lara has, has said. But as, whether it is driving the issue, I, I find that hard to believe based on, on, on black history in this country. Okay, and then to final question for Lara before we turn to the audience <clears throat> who are going to be thinking of very brief, succinct uh, <laughs> questions to be posing to all of us. Um, Lara, what progress has been made in laws, and you could focus on criminal uh, justice, uh, you, you have marked out um, nationwide areas of uh, reform that would uh, be needed, and you could list others. But what progress has been made since, say, the, the civil rights major settlements, uh, laws, court cases from the 1960s onward, and what, what other kinds of institutional, legal, structural changes still need to be uh, achieved? Sure. I recently wrote a piece about a slew of exonerations coming out of Baltimore, many in the 80s and the 90s. And a large number of them turned on coerced testimony by police. And what was interesting about writing this 
was that the detectives who, who did this and what they did was they separated these children, 12 and 13 year old children who were witnesses to crime from their parents, from their mothers and they told them cooperate or you'll never see your mother again. They told them say it was this person or we're gonna charge you. And these children crumbled under the pressure of that and they implicated other people and testified against them. It wasn't an isolated case, it happened over and over and over again, which is why Baltimore has exonerations kind of at a steady clip and is paying out, I think, in excess of $45 million now in these, these settlements. What's interesting about it is that the detectives who were doing this, they were really proud of it. And actually they were all, not all, but some of them became quite famous. They became famous because what they did was documented by David Simon in his book Homicide, which came out in 1991, which was on the basis for a series, Homicide Life on the Streets, and was really the genesis for some of the characters in, in The Wire, which is a beloved show. When you read the book though, it really doesn't age well. It's horrifying what they're doing to these children, much of it unspeakable and, and, and shocking. But when the book came out, it was acclaimed as an ethnography, as this incredible expose, and no one really blinked at what was being done to these kids, and no one really understood at the time that there were these downstream effects. It was just, well, their clearance rate was 74%, isn't that amazing? Well, it's not that amazing if you're clearing things where you're basically sending innocent people off to prison. And I guess to answer your question in kind of a roundabout way, that doesn't really happen anymore. That was also very prevalent in Chicago where people were actually physically tortured to confess and implicate other people. So the 80s and the 90s, I think those kinds of practices have been exposed and part of that is because we now understand that wrongful convictions happen. Whereas at that time they were a fever dream. They, they were like the thought of left-wing nut jobs like me. No one actually thought they were real. But now we know that they are in part because of DNA, but the majority of exonerations now have nothing to do with DNA. And so that movement has really uncovered a lot of these fundamental flaws and bad practices. I mean, I could talk endlessly about other things not having to do with police, but the point is, I do feel very optimistic. If you had told me, if you had told me when I started practicing in 2001 that I was gonna be collaborating with the district attorney to, to try to exonerate people and get their sentences reduced, I would have told you that you were insane. And so the fact that that has actually happened in my lifetime, I think really does speak to a remarkable amount of progress. I guess the final thing I would say is just, and this is not exactly a rejoinder, but just my thought about this idea that, you know, if you look back, things were so much worse, racism was so much worse, but things were less violent. I don't really think that history moves in a linear way. I mean, what Barack Obama said was, you know, it moves in zigs and zags, right? When did gun buying and gun purchasing skyrocket? It was when Barack Obama was elected. What did we get after Barack Obama? We got Donald Trump. We aren't moving towards this like perfect linear line towards this place of like inequality. In fact, when you start taking away power from people who've held onto it for a long time, they react and, and it's a pretty terrible backlash in a wide variety of ways. Okay, thank you for that exchange. Um, and now we have time for questions from the audience. Again, um, brief questions means please do be brief and please pose a question uh, for both of our guests if you wanna specify one guest um, or the other. Go ahead. Um, there we go. Hello, okay, there we go. Um, well, my question is primarily for Jason Riley, although I guess both of you could weigh into this if you want to. Um, you mentioned about how um, the black violence is largely due to the breakdown of the family. What do you think accounts for that over the decades? Like how the, you said the black family has been breaking down over the decades. Oh, there, there are several factors. I think, the, the, I think what, what started it was, was the migration uh, out of the South. Uh, it's, it's much um, uh, harder to you know, man a farm uh, as, a, as a single parent. And, and I, I think the stress on the family that the migration uh, uh, put on these families uh, started it. But later on, and more, probably more significantly, I think it was um, uh, the welfare state expansions, the well-intentioned welfare state expansions of the uh, Lyndon Johnson's Great Society programs, essentially saying that um, well, we, we can replace a man in a home with a government check. Don't worry about it. And, and, and the, the consequences of that, I think, have, have, been, have been devastating. Um, uh, paying people not to work, um, uh, or, or, or paying them in such a way uh, as to undermine a work ethic that would otherwise have developed. Um, I, I think there have been all kinds of negative consequences that have come out of well-meaning uh, uh, welfare state in interventions that have exacerbated uh, the problem um, uh, over the decades. 
So that, that's very largely Thomas Sowell's view, or, or at least part of what you said comes out of Sowell's. Sowell's view, yeah. I mean, it, it was, you know, it predates Sowell's writing, so I mean, um, yeah. but, but Sowell is one of the more prominent scholars who's, who's written about it, yeah. yeah. Laura, do you want to yeah, respond to that? Okay, next question. First, I'd just like to thank you guys for coming and talking to us. Um, and my question is for Fe Professor Bazelon, is that right? Yeah, it is. Sorry. Um, if you were to like lead the reform of the criminal justice system, what parameters or like identifiers would you use to single out specific laws to, to know which ones to reform? Like how would you quantify which laws were unjust and rooted in bad things? Oh, that sounds like a great project and I really hope someone puts me in charge of it. Um, I think, I teach criminal procedure, so I teach my law students kind of the basics of the Constitution, the Fourth Amendment against unreasonable search and seizures, the Fifth against um, unlawful self-incrimination, and the Sixth, your right to counsel. And with all of those, there are some real flaws, but I think just going back to like eyewitness identification, when I teach the doctrine of eyewitness identification to my students, I always say, I need to teach this to you. This is the law. This is gonna be on the bar. This is what the Supreme Court has said. And I, and I think that if this is trash, I think this is wrong. I don't think that the way that juries are told to evaluate eyewitness testimony, the way it comes into court in this completely credulous manner is appropriate. And we can see from the statistics how often people are wrong, particularly when it's cross-racial, you don't know the person. I would definitely start by overhauling those laws. It's not like you could never have eyewitness identification because then we couldn't have any prosecutions. But what you can have are cautionary instructions. You can have education around these issues because so often with, a lot of these, a lot of these practices. Just just focusing on this one, although I mean I could think of others. You know, if you're sitting in the jury box and somebody is sitting on the stand and they're pointing <clears throat> to your client and they and they say that's the person, that is incredibly. There's nothing more powerful than that. There's nothing more damning than that. And yet we know how often people are wrong. Just think about yourself. How many times have you passed someone on the street, thought it was your friend, and been completely wrong? Now imagine that happening when a gun was pointed at you in the dark. And so. There's a lot of practices like that where we have jurisprudence from the Supreme Court from the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, and it hasn't changed that much, even though we know it really should. Thank you. Hi, uh, my question, oh, thank you. <laughs> my question is for uh, Mr. Riley. I was wondering what role you believe masculinity uh, plays in kind of this role of violence uh, within black communities because I do not think um, it is as much a, a black violence issue as it is more a black man violence issue in the same way that domestic violence against whites is not as much like a white issue, but more a white man issue. And so I'd love to know kind of what your opinion is on like masculinity or if you agree with that at all. Well, I, th I think you're right statistically. I mean, we, um, uh, there, there is, even when we talk about the black crime rate in this country, uh, and people always say, you know, they point to figures like blacks are 12 or 13% of the population but are committing more than half of all homicides, an absolute majority of all homicides in the country. It's even worse than that because it, blacks are 12% of the population, but it's really black men who are doing this who are not 12% of the population, like 6 or 7% of the population or less. And then it's young black men. So it's even smaller. So you, it, it is uh, a very much a male-driven phenomenon. Uh, but in terms of masculinity, you, you, I think you'd have to ask an anthropologist about the role <laughs> of, uh, of, of, uh, of men and, and, and aggression and, 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 and so forth. Um, but um, but, but I, I will make a, a small point there about uh, men. I mean, we, when, when people talk about um, disparities uh, and we quickly jump to, uh, to the racial disparity. There are other disparities, and we don't seem to question whether something nefarious is going on. Uh, you know, uh, men are more likely to commit violent crimes than women. Is the criminal justice system sexist? Or does it reflect this male aggression you're talking about? Um, you know, young, younger people commit more violent crimes than older people. Is the system, again, biased? in that way? Or that, does, does that simply def that reflect differences in behavior uh, within groups? And, and, and so I think there is, there is something to that. But I, I'd have to leave the, the masculinity question to, to the anthropologist. Thank you so much. <laughs> Mara, do you want to yeah, intrude that was really, that Okay, all right. Next question, please. Hi, uh, my name is Angel, and I just 
I'm just going to read it. <laughs> um, so this can, anyone can answer. Uh, so I just wrote, I wonder what the role of mass incarceration has been on the increase in violent crime in black and brown poor communities. Does increased incarceration historically and the violence in prisons perpetuate a culture of violence when these people or individuals return to their communities? Is the question clear? About so the I think I, okay, let me see if I understand. Are you, so is the question, uh, does, does locking people up for extended periods of time then perpetuate a cycle of violence in communities when, when folks are let out and come back to their communities and then there's more violence because of that? Like that essentially that, that prisons are, carcin are criminogenic? Uh, I guess uh, surrounding that, kind of the role in culturalization of prison, but also the role that um, historic incarceration might have on a, a home not having certain family members or figures in the long term. So both of those kind of without and when individuals come back from uh, imprisonment. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I mean, I think that as, as probably everyone can imagine, prison is an absolutely horrific place to be and there's absolutely nothing rehabilitative about it. It's there to punish you and make your life as miserable as possible. It's incredibly violent. And a lot of people who are incarcerated, if they didn't go in with violent tendencies or maybe had some but not a lot, come, can, uh, come out very, very hardened if for no other reason than they're just trying to survive in there. And that's particularly true for people who are younger who come in. And that started happening in particular when we started locking up 16 and 17 and 18 year old children and putting them into adult prisons. And so then you're asking, well, what happens at the end of that? So you do your 10 years or your 15 years, what happens when you come home? What are you fit to do? Well, you can't live anywhere because you have a felony conviction. So it's very, very hard for you to find housing. Nobody wants to hire you because you have this quote, serious violent conviction on your record. Uh, it's very hard to reintegrate into these family relationships. A lot of times people have moved on, whether it's a romantic partner or even you know, close family members and friends. So when you rip people out of their communities and lock them up for long periods of time and then put them back, not surprisingly, it's, it's deeply problematic. It's very, very hard, I think, for people to reintegrate. And part of that is the way that we incarcerate people, the way that we treat them. And part of that is the fact that we're very fond of defining people by the worst thing that they ever did. So you know, you didn't commit a robbery, you're a robber, you're a murderer, and when you come out, that's, that's your identity. That's, that's, that's why you can't vote, that's why you can't serve on a jury, that's why you can't live in public housing, et cetera. And so, yes, we have a cycle of locking people up for long periods of time to be punitive, but eventually most people do get out, and then it's very, very hard to have any kind of a, a normal, law-abiding, well-adjusted life because it's just, the opportunities are so, are so few. Next question, please. Yes, Patrick is my name, and uh, my wife is not here because Dr. Lowry last time kind of put her over the edge. Uh, she would have been more over the edge tonight, I think. My question is, uh, we discussed systemic racism or just plain racism, personal responsibility, the New Deal, whatever, we try to find reasons for the way things are the way they are. And having married into a black family six decades ago and watching most of the things that uh, our speakers uh, ad addressed, how they developed within families and so over the years, trying to explain to people who haven't had that experience what goes on, I was having trouble finding words for it until I read Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast. And every page of that, let me take this off, every page of that book nailed it my personal experience, what happens to African-Americans, African-American families over six decades? And um, I don't have anything more to say than to ask our speakers to give, if they're familiar with her work, uh, what you think about the idea that the relationship between white Americans and black Americans from the South, not Africans, not Jamaicans, Specifically, and I've seen that over and over and okay, over. Okay, so do they know of Isabel Wilkerson's book? I don't cast know. Do you know? Because if you don't, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm familiar with her, her first book, Warren for Brothers Phones, well, but not Cast, so I can't okay, speak Okay, I would to, suggest to that, that one, so. Cast explains Sorry. a lot of what you're trying to get at. Laura, do you Thank have you. a... I'm in the same boat as Jason in that I'm familiar with her work, but I've not read Cast, so I don't feel comfortable commenting. Okay, okay. Great. All right, thank you. Next question. I think we've got time for these three, if we're, if we're brief. Uh, this is a question for both. Uh, also, I just want to say it was really cool, you know, seeing you guys talk and converse. Uh, really good experience. Uh, thank you. Uh, so 
question is, do you think advocating for policy to help reverse the effects of systemic racism will in turn help uh, deal with the effects of it? So like, what I mean, the effects of systemic racism, that could be subjective, but to list some, you know, crime weight uh, and like wealth disparity, like stuff like that. So rephrase what, what the question again, it will? Uh, do you think advocating for policy to help reverse the effects of systemic racism will help in turn deal you know, with the effects that it created or like, you know, problems that it created, I should say. Well, uh, sure, I just think people are gonna disagree on which policies will, will, will move us toward those objectives. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the whole, that's the whole issue here. Um, uh, and that's, I think, that sort of gets to the, the crux of, of the problem. Some people think certain policies are helping um, and, and I often think that those policies are having uh, the opposite effect. Um, uh, so, you know, <clears throat> one thing we haven't well, touched on, I mean, we use the term systemic racism, but one thing we haven't talked about is who's running the system these days. And it's assumed that, you know, a bunch of white people are in charge and they're perpetrating systemic racism. There's, there's a very good book by a uh, black law professor at Yale named James Foreman, um, who before becoming a law professor at Yale was a public defender in Washington, D.C. for a number of years. Um, I guess a similar trajectory. Um, and and, and whose politics question. are much closer to, to Lara's than mine. Um, he wrote a book called Locking Up Our Own. And he talks about his experience as a, as a public defender. And he says, you know, one day, I, 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 you know, I'm defending this guy, the kid's black, uh, the cop who arrested him is black, the judge we're arguing the case for is black, we're in a, a, a courthouse named after another black judge, um, uh, we're in a city with a black police chief. Uh, it's often forgotten the, 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 the role to which blacks are part of the system today, a big difference from what it used to be. Uh, blacks have a tremendous amount of political clout in, 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 in large black cities, from everything from being the governor, to being the mayor, to running the police system, to running the school system, to running the fire department, to running the city council, um, uh, to, 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 to being well represented on the police force, uh, on the bench, and so forth. So again, to me, this sort of undermines a lot of the systemic racism talk when you take a closer look at who's running the system, or, or who has a lot of influence in the system today. That is, it is such a powerful point, and um, I, I highly recommend locking up our own, and it is really interesting that this whole idea of being tough on crime and locking people up, this was something that everybody bought into. Democrats bought into it, Republicans bought into it. I mean, it was just a race to see who could be the toughest. Black people bought into it, white people bought into it, and I think Locking Up Our Own does a masterful job of sort of explaining why and what people were after and how all of those policies really uh, failed to achieve what they were designed to achieve. But, but Jason is absolutely right, and actually, if Skettle does another talk like this, they should have James Foreman come and talk about all of this because it's, it's such an interesting discussion and it's a discussion that needs its own event. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I just want to say, I think you guys both did fantastic. And I guess my question's for both of you. Um, one, of the, one of the things that was talked about was crime rates. So I wanted to ask, to what extent do you believe that socioeconomic conditions play a role in crime rates? And if you believe it's a driving factor, do you believe that past racially motivated policies play a role in today's economic outlook? The, the socioeconomic conditions caused by earlier racist policies or yes, laws or institutions. Okay. Who wants to who wants to go for Well, I, I think I spoke to this a little earlier when I pointed out that um, black communities are much safer when they were much poorer than they are today. And uh, we're not making a causal link here. But w w one thing we often talk about is 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 uh, it's it's assumed that poverty drives crime. And I think that the truth is closer to the reverse of that. Businesses flee crime-ridden neighborhoods. Jobs follow. Property values fall. One reason uh, those communities back in the 40s and 50s 
were much safer, uh, much less violent. Um, uh, 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 and you saw the, the, the sort of upward mobility that we saw at the time that we haven't really talked about is because they were much less violent. Um, Ferguson, Missouri still has not recovered from the riots after Michael Brown. Baltimore still hasn't recovered <laughs> from the riots after MLK's assassination. Newark is still, I mean, these, the, it can take generations uh, or longer for, for, for these communities to make it back. And, 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 and that's why when, when I hear these, the defund the police rhetoric and, and all the rest, and I go, if, you know, upward mobility is much, much more difficult when bullets are flying all around the neighborhood. I mean, if you want upward mobility, it's compatible with tough on crime laws. The two things go hand in hand. And, 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 and so I, I, would, I would just make that point. So yes, there is a, I think there is a connection now. Yeah. Or do you? I guess I would answer that question a little bit differently. I think something that is often overlooked when we talk particularly about, about crime is, is class and that that's a huge part of it, right? That people who don't have any resources, they don't have access to education, they don't have uh, supportive environments growing up, they don't have water that isn't tainted to drink, you know, all of these things, they're going to lead inevitably to bad outcomes, to statistically, statistically worse outcomes, right? So I do think that that as long as people are poor and deprived of opportunities, they're more likely to be system involved. They're more likely to turn to crime. And I think that's true across race. And so you know, your question was really about socioeconomics and I am not an economist and I know you just had Glenn Lowry here. So I feel like very unqualified to, to say anything about economics other than it seems to me that yes, poverty is a driver of crime and that to some degree, this is all a vicious circle for the reasons that Jason described and then until we have more economic equality and more opportunities, and until we stop permanently tainting and branding people as criminals and giving them no opportunity for redemption, we're gonna to continue to have these cycles. Thank you. Final question. Thank you. Um, I initially didn't have a question, but now I do. Uh, I initially wanted to thank um, Jason for his masterful work on uh, Thomas Sowell, The Maverick. Oh, I enjoyed you. reading that book. Thank you for writing that sincerely. Um, so my question is, I think I've just listened to both of you talk, I've listened to the common denominator here is the government. And for you, Dr. Um, uh, Baslam, I hope I got that correctly. Um, it seems to me th to be the case that I understand that a lot of uh, cases never get to trial. They almost always end up, and there's a lot of flexibility and discretion around how um, an, a, a prosecutor can decide to prosecute a case or not prosecute a case or give a deal. But this is not the case at all for sentencing where judges must give this um, specific amount and this is probably related to some uh, 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 law. What are your thoughts on that, especially about this huge idea that the state wants to punish you but the state now defends you with the idea of a public defender? Um, it seems to me giving uh, prosecutors that much power they can decide, just a racist prosecutor could literally choose to punish um, more black people than white people. What are your thoughts on that too? And I also wanted to um, ask you, uh, Jason, about your thoughts on, you mentioned something very, very slightly in the 40s and 50s, Lyndon Johnson's Great Society. Uh, the welfare state has risen since then and seems to be the case that with the rise of the welfare state, um, it was supposed to make the lives of minorities better, but that has not happened. Um, why is that the case? And what should we do to fix that problem? Okay, so let's let Laura go first on the, the prosecutorial discretion, I guess, is a, yeah. Thank you for your question. There was so much packed into it. You pronounced my name right, but the doctor in my family is actually my mother, Dr. Uh, Eileen Baslon. I am not a doctor. Couldn't make it through pre-med. Um, so there's a lot to say about, about the difference in outcomes. You're absolutely right. All the discretion is at the front end, and it's the question is, you know, you have somebody who's arrested, are you gonna charge them? And what are you, if you charge them, what are you going to charge them with? And what kind of an offer are you gonna make? And there's something called the trial penalty, which essentially is what happened to Utico. What they offered Utico was, I think, something like six years, and he got 
60, right? And that was the penalty that he paid for going to trial and getting convicted and getting sentenced under this habitual offender law. So as long as that's happening and prosecutors are exercising discretion in that way, fewer and fewer people are gonna exercise their right to trial. It's just too risky. They're just gonna take the deal whether they did it or not, which is part of what I was saying when I feel like we're only at the tip of the iceberg when it comes to these wrongful convictions. Over 95% of cases plead out. Many people plead out after you know talking to their lawyer for five seconds because they're confronted with what I just confronted you with and they're just gonna take that deal whether they did it or not. And then on the back end, yeah, prosecutors continue to have a lot of power because those charging decisions play into it. So if a prosecutor t charges a mandatory minimum, the judge has no discretion. They have to impose that mandatory minimum, right? So judges are somewhat handcuffed to the laws and the charges that prosecutors choose to bring. And what's also actually, I think, really, really fascinating about the sentencing process is that even if prosecutors lose and there is acquitted conduct, so they maybe get a conviction on one charge but acquittals on the other, they can argue the acquitted conduct to the judge at sentencing as a reason to ratchet up the sentence. And so at every single step of the process, you see prosecutors being the most powerful actors in the system and the drivers of almost everything that happens once an arrest is made. Jason? Um, the, the period I was referencing earlier, the mid-20th century, is, a, a, I think, a really a, an underappreciated period in black history. Um, I, I understand why um, it's not talked about, um, particularly on the left, as much as it should be. But um, uh, I think we can learn a lot from what was going on back then. Uh, between 1940 and 1960, uh, the black poverty rate in this country fell by 40 percentage points. That's, uh, we're talking about before a Voting Rights Act uh, of 1964, or 65, before a Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, before affirmative action, which gets all this credit for creating a black middle class. Um, 40 point drop in the poverty rate among blacks, when frankly the government didn't give a damn what was going on in black America. Um, and you had all kinds of systemic racism going on legally. You could put a sign in your window, we don't hire black people, perfectly legal. Poverty rate plummeting. Um, black incomes in the 1950s and 40s were growing at a faster rate among blacks than among whites. Again, growing not just in absolute terms, but growing relative to white incomes. That's called a narrowing of income inequality. It was happening. Uh, these welfare state interventions, I think, interfered with progress that was going on. I think they were well-intentioned, but they ultimately interfered. And when people talk about what should we do, one of the books you mentioned earlier is called Please Stop Helping Us. I'm of the opinion it's what we need to stop doing. We don't need a new government program. We need to stop doing things that we know don't work. Uh, stop keeping kids trapped in schools that have been failing generation after generation after generation of poor minorities in this. I th I'd say stop raising minimum wages that price young black kids out of jobs in our economy. Stop passing these occupational licensing requirements that, that uh, stifle budding entrepreneurs in minority communities from starting their own jitney service or, 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 or hair braiding salon and so forth. It's about what the government needs to stop doing to me, not so much what they need to start doing. Well, thank you for that. Um, we, uh, we have a few closing uh, remarks to make, but I think we're gonna begin with a very important topic here in Arizona having to do with water, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so uh, welcome both of you from other parts of the country where there's more water. We have a water bottle giveaway here, uh, which is a very, very important thing. Uh, 